Welcome to the time-lapse camera tutorial. And before we get started, this will be a great thing to do again as people trickle in. So the tutorial is uh, the most updated version on the website was is uh, newer than, than what might be on your computer now. So if you're noticing a difference between the uh, computer, the version that you have in your notebook or um, and the version that I'm sharing here, Cassie on the Hack Week Help B channel has included the steps to follow along to um, update your um, update your version onto your computer. So if you want to do that, I invite you to open a terminal window. The steps are way down here. She's outlined this much better and much easier to follow along. But the simple steps are doing a, a git status, a git checkout main, a git fetch. And then um, the step is the final step you'll do is actually a git pull snow x main. So um, Cassie is online and Joe is as well. So um, we'll take one or two more minutes and pause if people want to update their version and get the get the freshest version from the website. If you if you that's if you want to follow along and step through. If you want to follow along on the website, that's totally fine too. Cassie also included the link for the rendered version too, and it's the same content in both places with all the output. So if you just want to scroll through and interact with the maps that we're going to show today and look at the code and um, look at some of the outputs, you're welcome to do that as well. So the final step that you might have to do if you want to step through is actually to um, restart the output and clear, clear all, cl sorry, restart the kernel and clear all the outputs. So again, if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the Hack Week Help B channel. And while folks are doing that, for those that are comfortable, I just want to take a quick poll and see um, if you want to react with like a thumbs up or like a party hat or you know party sign if you've used time lapse cameras before or have worked with the data before or know what a um, camera like a time lapse camera is. Okay, cool. So you've got a couple. Um, while we're doing, if people are nice, sweet, so we got some thumbs up, party hats, so maybe people feel very positively about camera traps. That's really awesome. I'm actually gonna hold up if you're have your if you can see my screen, if people can see my video. So this is actually one of the cameras that was used on the Grand Mesa. Oops, there's my camera. Um, if you haven't worked with time lapse cameras before, uh, I want to give you a sense of what they look like. You've got the lens right here. This is just like a normal digital camera lens. Um, the flash way up here. And then inside has all the, the guts of a cam of a time lapse camera. This is where you can change the settings. We'll talk about some of the different settings that you might use. You can put in a memory card um, on the side, and then a, and then also in the one thing that's really cool about these time lapse cameras is that um, there's a big battery pack, so you can load in a bunch of batteries too. And so these can be installed for long periods of time and um, be put up in, in pretty harsh conditions at, at cold temperatures. So that's what one looks like if you haven't worked with it before. You've got a strap, you can strap around a tree, you can strap around a pole. Um, so this is what makes them really powerful to be uh, installed in, in different places and new places. And then um, you can pretty much put them in your, in your study site anywhere you want. So that's a, cam that's a time lapse camera. And the goals of this tutorial, we'll jump back to, the, jump back to it and look at the, the learning objectives for today. We want to give you a sense of how many cameras were installed during the 2017 and 2020 field campaigns. We had a, a bunch that were installed in both. Uh, this, this tutorial is going to focus on the 2020 data, but we'll share information on both 2017 and 2020. We'll take a look at some example images. Now you've seen what one of these cameras looks like, but we want to give you a sense of, of what one of these images looks like too. And, how much information and, and the different types of information that you can pull from, from these images. And we'll also give you a sense of, of just where they were on the Mesa. By day four, you, you probably are starting to feel comfortable with, with looking at the Grand Mesa maps. You maybe attended the geospatial tutorials. So we'll show you where those are and how you might use these locations in addition to some of the geo information that you, you've now learned. We'll also um, talk about some of the different science applications that you can use and the different measurements that you can pull from time-lapse images. So one of those that's um, been pulled already is snow depth measurements, and that's particularly from the SnowX 2020 data. But of course, we'll we'll talk about the, the other types of measurements that could be pulled from the 2020 images too. 
And then finally, we'll look at um, more science applications, comparing depths from these time-lapse cameras to each other, and, and maybe also from different SnowX instruments too. So again, if you have any questions before you get started, just go ahead and put those in the Slack channel. Let's talk more though about what these camera, where these cameras were put up, how many were put up, when they were put up, and, and what it means to set up a time-lapse camera. So we'll start with the 2017 SnowX data. The 28 were installed on the Grand Mesa. They were installed in September and then left up until June 2017. And then the, the time-lapse part comes in in that they took a photo, they took several photos a day, every single day between that time period. And then you can think about how you could string all those photos together from all the different times of the day to every day and get this time series of what winter looked like on the Grand Mesa in, the, in that field year 2017. In addition to taking a photo at multiple times a day, every day, there was an orange pole that was installed in front of these of 15 of these cameras, and that was for the snow depth measurements. And we'll talk a little bit more later on about um, what these snow depth measurements looks like and how you can get that from an orange pole. <laughs> uh, finally, these images have been submitted to the NSIDC, and a shout out to Mark Rowley for, for doing that. There's a there's the with all it has all the metadata in there too. So if you have questions more about the naming conventions and any more information about locations, um, Mark Rally is a great person to talk to. So that's the 2017 data. The focus of this um, tutorial it will be on the 2020 time lapse cameras. In this case, um, 29 we have 29 time lapse cameras. We actually started with 30 and then one disappeared. So we have 29 cameras from the 2020 field season. Similar to 2017, they were installed in September and then taken down around June. In this case, they um, similarly took multiple photos a day. Um, it's really great to have these cameras taking multiple photos a day because um, there can be things like a storm or the ice lens might freeze up um, or there might be like a fog or a cloud blocking it. But if you have it take multiple times a day, you can start to increase your sample size and have redundancy and, and make sure you're having as a complete a time series as possible. In this case, uh, a similar to the 2017 data, um, a bright colored pole was installed in front of the camera also for snow depth measurements. In this case, it was a red pole. And I'll show you examples of um, what, these, what these red poles look like. And finally, because we know there are groups that are working with this data set, we wanted to make sure um, you all understood how the naming convention works because we have a couple of the project groups that are using the um, using some so using some of these images. So the the first letter in these time lapse images indicates which side of the mesa that these time lapse cameras were set up on. So whether it was the east side or the west side, and if it's the east side, the first letter of the name will be an E, and if it's the west side, the first letter of the Mesa of the name will be a W. And the second, the second part of the name indicates how much vegetation there is, and it's a number one through nine. So one is least vegetation and nine is most vegetation. And another way you might think about this is um, open and closed canopy. So I know that there are some project groups that were interested in looking at canopy in particular in these time-lapse images and um, a number that's high up, like an eight or a nine, is going to be closed canopy, whereas uh, the lower down numbers will be an open canopy. W um, within each of these vegetation classes, there are also intermediate, like it, inter different subclasses of snow, so low, intermediate, and high snow depths, and all of that's derived from the 2017 Snow X LiDAR measurements. Finally, the last part of the naming convention is just which replicate it is. So um, if you have something that's on the east side and it's got a lot of vegetation, so it's a nine, and you've got a couple of those sites, so two on the east, two sites on the east side that are both um, closed canopy. So one would be given an A value and one would be given a B value. So as you're as you're working with some of these images, that that third letter, um, just keep in mind that that means that there's probably another one that's um, in that sit that has that has the same properties. So as far as the 2020 NSIDC submission goes, that's in progress for submission um, that and will update the SnowX community when it's available online. In the meantime, we um, are excited for people to use this data set. And so we have a subset of it available for you to use during Hack Week. And that will be available on the um, S3, the AWS S3 server. And if you have any questions about that, we have 
example code included in this tutorial for how to access those images. But if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to me and um, I, or Cassie, and we'd be um, delighted to help you out. So now that you all know a little bit more about how many cameras there were and um, what it means to, that they're time lapse, that they're taking these multiple images per day, let's go ahead and take a look at where they are on the Grand Mesa. And fortunately, by day four, um, as I said earlier, we've got some familiarity with the Grand Mesa. Um, we are going to make an interactive plot um, to look at where these cameras are so you all can click around and see what, um, what cameras were installed where. The first step is just to use this um, package called Folium. And Folium is a, has a, lot, uh, is a really great Python library to do um, interactive map making. Um, so we're going to uh, just give people a preview for um, these locations. And then we'll show you how you can make this map in a little bit more of an automated way. If you're working on the on um, if you're working on the um, in your notebook or on the website, if you I'm not going to do it here, but there if you click on these three dots, you'll see that there's a lot of code that goes into making a map like this. And so we'll show you later how you can do this in a lot fewer steps. But um, for for fun, we can click around and look at the different snow pole locations. So the red is the 2017 data. We've got um, some different locations across the Mesa. And then we also have the 2020 locations. And you can see that these are all on the east side, so they're given an E value. We've got some um, in the closed canopy and um, two, different type, two different places in the closed canopy, so an E9E and an E9G. And we can um, you know, zoom in and see how close these poles are to each other, and then some places where they're much further and we can go all the way out to the west side. So let's. So here's just a broad overview of where these snow poles and these um, snow cameras are across the mesa. Now let's go ahead and, and keep stepping through our notebook, and let's see a better, a, a more efficient way to do the code for for making these maps. And you might remember from uh, Micah Johnson's uh, SnowX SQL database, we'll be using that. For, for uploading this data here as well. We've got um, some of the packages that, that Micah showed us earlier this week to load the SnowX SQL library, some other packages that you've probably seen before by now, a GeoPandas and Pandas and NumPy, and all of these will be to manage the, the data that's in the SQL library. And then we've got a few more packages for visualization as well, and that's Matplot, IPython, and Seaborn. So the SnowX, these, the SnowPole, the information about where the cameras are and um, the time of day that they took photos and the date and then also the snow depth value, all of that is uploaded into the SnowX SQL database. And I'll show you, we'll show you now how to access that. So that now we're just gonna set some, a few more parameters for um, just to have some default settings when we're, when we're working with plots too. So that's this bottom code right here. But now just like our map earlier, we're gonna make another map using this snow x sql database so for your projects if you want to make a map um, to show where these time lapse cameras are you can use some of this example code here and just like the the sequels that you might have done earlier this the sql queries that you might have done earlier this week in this case we'll be looking at point data so the the camera locations are uploaded to the sql database as point data so your first step will do a query for point data and then you'll filter and the instrument in this case, or how we took this measurement, was a camera. So if, so if you're working with this, uh, make sure that you include the, the camera word for your filter. Then we can turn it into a GeoPandas data frame, and we can start to take a look at the data. So again, thank you to Micah for uploading this into the SnowX SQL database. We've got a lot of information uh, on these cameras, and we can start to look at some of the columns that we see. We've got longitude. There's probably a latitude right here too. We've got the equipment ID, um, a little bit more information about location and a geometry. And then this value down here is actually the snow depth value. And I'll, I'll talk more about how we, um, we got that snow depth information. But for now, for looking at this data set and where these cameras are and, and the information on the time-lapse imagery, we're gonna go ahead and just make the, the data frame a little bit easier to interpret. So I'll pull out the some of the columns of interest. We've got our um, data frame 
um, variable right there. And then we'll looking at the we're looking at the equipment column, the time column, a latitude, a latitude, and a value. So the equipment, you can see we've got the camera IDs uh, all there listed in the in the column. We've got some from the east side, from the west side, right down here. This is a likely an open canopy location. Up here is a closed canopy. This one took these cameras took pictures at 1 p.m. and 11 a.m. and 12 p.m. So it's and then we've got the latitude and longitude and the snow depth value. There's a um, the SQL database does um, indicates a time zone. So this uh, six six o'clock time right here indicates the time zone. So if we want to map the um, the camera locations using the SQL database, we can do we can pull the geometries from this data and turn it into a GeoPandas data frame. So that's what this next cell is doing here. And then um, in this next line, this is a preview. We'll do, we're going to map our time-lapse cameras in reference to our snow pit locations. And this is to show you how, show you where these time-lapse cameras are in reference to another SnowX data set. One thing that is interesting that has been brought up earlier is how a lot of these SnowX data sets can be used in conjunction with each other. So we thought we'd give um, folks a preview of how of how some of these data sets relate to each other. So we've got the we've got the geometries from um, the camera depths and then the pits we grabbed up um, earlier right here in this code. And so we've printed out and in total, we, we see that we have the 29 ca camera trap locations and the 150 um, snow pit locations. So let's put it all together to see, let's map these two side by side. We'll um, put these on a plot. Um, this is, if you all attended the David Sheen geospatial tutorial, some of this code might look familiar. We um, did not put in a base map here, but uh, David Sheen uh, shared a really awesome elevation base map that uh, we could see substituting instead of this grid, and that could be a great way to to look at how some of these time lapse cameras are on a elevation gradient. Um, but for now, let's look at the we have the same uh, map that you saw earlier in the interactive version, but now it's um, plotted on the easting and northing for the x and y, and we can see how it it compares to the pit locations too. So if you're looking at this and, and you're thinking about uh, snow science questions, one thing you could think about is, is how these data sets could be used together and simple observations about the, uh, the differences between the two. So one thing that's really great about these time-lapse cameras is that we have a really big spread covering the whole Mesa on the east and west side for this 2020, um, this 2020 Snow X field campaign. We have also some overlap um, between the snow pits and the time-lapse cameras. Both took depth measurements, so you could think about um, how uh, depth might uh, be similar or different between these two types of instruments. The time-lapse cameras also have um, snow depths for um, the whole winter season, so you can look at change across the mesa for these snow depth measurements. And if you added a geospatial map, you could look at maybe how um, things changed across that elevation gradient or in and out of the canopy. So you have any other ideas for things that um, you would want to look at if you were just simply just looking at these locations and how they, um, what observations you can make, feel free to put those in the Slack too. We're really excited to see people using this data set for um, uh, modeling questions and um, hydrology questions. So now that we know where the, uh, where these SnowX um, 2020 camera and snow poles are. Um, let's go ahead and uh, look at the photos. And if you haven't looked at time-lapse camera images before, um, we this is a really great chance to look at these and start to brainstorm the different types of information that you can get from these, um, these images. So the first step that we'll do is we're going to pull them from the, um, oops, we're going to pull them from the AWS server. And uh, you can do that by running uh, this line of code. This is um, this will the NSIDC website will will have these pictures up um, in the upcoming months. And if you have any trouble with accessing this again, feel free to reach out to me. But we'll um, we'll go ahead and, and copy these into our notebook, and um, 
this next line just reminds us that this is just a subset of the SNOEX 2020 data and the full data set will be uploaded soon. And then to display them, we can work with it just like we would any other image. We're gonna look at one camera from the east side. In this case, it's from a high, um, a high vegetation area. It's one of the replicates and we'll pull the images and display them from various times of the winter. And I'm excited to see what you all think about um, just what it means to look at a camera that's taking a picture in the same place over and over again, um, just how much data you can pull from these um, from these images. A picture is worth a thousand words. And by looking at these time-lapse images over the course of time, you can really start to see um, the data potential. So here's the, the camera. We have an early season uh, image from October. In these time-lapse cameras, they're set to tell you the temperature. So they gather, they have a thermometer reading in there. They also record the date and the time, um, the camera ID. And in this case, the this October image, you can start to see some information about the vegetation. So this is probably some summer vegetation that's still there. There's already been a snow event by October. Uh, we've got some trees in the background that don't have snow. There's a pole in the middle. There's snow on the pole. We can move down into now winter and we still see that we are collecting that awesome metadata on temperature and date and time. The snow is now higher on the pole. And if you look in the back, you can even see some snow and trees. Moving down to May, there's been some snow melt and um, we've got some patchy snow, um, no more snow and trees, and we still have that metadata on the bottom. We've included some questions and I'll pause here for a second and as people are, are scrolling along and, and let you all take a second to think about these things. So what do you notice here? Are we in a, <clears throat> are we in a closed canopy site or an open canopy site? When you look at these images, do you see with your eye the snow rising on the pole or falling on the pole? Um, it's difficult in these 2D images to, um, we're looking at something, a 3D thing, snow depth and looking at it in the 2D. So start to think about some of the, some of the um, ways that you might approach that. And of course, what are some of the other properties that you might be able to measure using these devices? So we'll talk more about, about that last question too. We, I know that there's a lot of uh, projects that are, are already looking at this and, and this is just the beginning of a lot of these applications. So uh, moving down to the, moving down to the time-lapse applications, I mentioned that the snow depth um, is available on the SnowX SQL database and I'll show you first how we how we measured snow depth or extracted snow depth from these images and then how to how to create a time series from these cameras. So one of the reasons why we use snow poles is because uh, for as you all have probably done in your own work, going out and taking a snow depth measurement uh, can be uh, sometimes kind of laborious that you have to um, go out there in the winter, you take a lot of measurements that can be um, it can, the conditions can be difficult, it can be expensive to get out there. And using these snow depth poles, um, we can put them up in September before the snow comes, collect them in June. Um, the camera will do the hard work for you and take these pictures and get these um, and get this data. Um, but then the, the tricky part is that the camera will take the pictures for you, but then you have to turn that into a snow depth measurement. And um, we'll talk about how that was done for the 2020 data set. So uh, the crux of the of the method behind it is that you can take the length of a snow free pole, find the length of it, and then find the length of a stake with snow and the difference between the two. So like this section right here that's missing is actually the snow depth. And you can convert that into um, something in centimeters by using a ratio of how many pixels are represented by the length of the pole. And so for example, um, we know the full length of the pole was about 300 centimeters in this case, 304.8 centimeters. And so um, we can figure out how many pixels that's getting represented by in this image and um, multiply, multi multiple, multiply that difference by this ratio and you can have the snow depth. So for this 2020 SnowX data set, that was all done manually in the spirit of having a strong legacy data set that was as accurate as possible 
for people to work with snow depths for their applications. And there are um, automated methods as well out there that we've included at the bottom of this tutorial. Um, and we have some groups that are already applying this method um, on, their, on their snow poles. So we'll take a look now about um, the, the product of um, extracting snow depth from all 29 of these 2020 snow poles. If we keep stepping through our notebook, we'll make a plot now using the data that's um, on the SQL database. So this has all already been uploaded. We are going to look at um, plot depths at two different cameras. We're going to compare two cameras on the same side of the Mesa, cameras W1A and W9A. So one's an open site and the other is a closed site. Let's first uh, go back to our we're just going to do a quick plot in Folium of where these cameras are. So um, we've got the, the full Mesa, but now we're just zooming in on the west side. And we have our, our open site and our closed site. But maybe maybe we actually want to know a little bit more about what the cameras look, what the images look like. So we can keep stepping through and load in some example images of these, of these um, from these cameras and take a look at what it means for an open site. <laughs> and then of course the, the, the closed site as well. So on the open site, we um, have uh, no tree cover. You can even start to see clouds in the background. Um, in the closed site, it's completely tree cover. It's in the middle of a forest. So let's see how snow depth compares from these two. We'll pull the, we're gonna do a query now for the snow depth from both sites. So in this, we have the W1A and the W9A, those are our camera IDs. And in our query, we're going to look at point data and do a filter. And then on the equipment column, we're looking for what contains this open site, which we've saved as W1A in, that, in the variable, sorry, the open site variable is W1A. Same thing for the, Vegetative site, we'll do the exact same step and we'll um, look up the equipment where it contains the W9A ID. And then we can turn both into a GeoPandas data frame. And the next step right here is, is a Python trick where we'll take the date column, um, so when the camera was taking photos, and we're just gonna set that, set that as our index. And that will make it a lot easier um, for plotting. So you can run that cell and now we can go ahead and make our plot. Because we've um, set our index as our date, we can just pull our um, snow depth values, which is saved as value in the SQL database. And we can just plot that on our date and make sure to label um, our respective lines and our axes, and of course, make it a title too. So we'll go ahead and um, we'll go ahead and make our plot and take a look at the snow depth time series from both our open site and our forest site. It's really awesome to, to see how um, we can get a complete time series from these time-lapse images. In the beginning, there's usually a lot more, a little bit of noise because um, vegetation, there's a little, still a lot of vegetation from the summer that makes it hard to see the bottom of the pole. But when you look at this time series, you can already see that there's these accumulation events in the beginning when, when there's uh, building a snowpack and the, a bigger snow accumulation event in the middle of the winter, and even a peak um, snow depth. And then we can start to see snow melt too, and differences between an open and canopy site. Uh, this is um, really, um, if, if you're interested in hydrology questions or even ecology questions of how snow might differ between an uh, open and closed site and some of those applications for, um, for questions that you're interested in, we've cited a paper um, here that, that looked at differences in snow in the Pacific Northwest and how snow disappearance timing differed depending on, depending on your forest, um, forested region. And so um, I'll pause here for another second about um, when you're looking at this time series, what are some of the differences that you notice between an open and closed canopy site? Which one has more snow? Where does the snow last longer? Um, where does um, melt happen faster? And, if, and then looking at this time series, there is still some noise, um, a little bit of up and down happening, even when the snowpack might be pretty stable and here when there's no snowpack. Um, so what are some drawbacks to using these, snow, these um, time-lapse cameras for snow depth? And here we've just compared two sites. 
but we have 29 cameras and snow depths for all of them. So what would it look like to compare the snow depths from um, snow depths from all these cameras using these different um, features? So canopy or elevation, or um, you could think about all the different ways that you could look at the, the snow depths across the Mesa from these time-lapse cameras, or even looking at these relative to other SnowX instruments too, like snow pits or um, any of the other data sets. So the, the final application that we've um, presented here, and, and we'll end it here and then talk about how there could be so many more, is um, this citizen science project that um, was led by the Mountain Hydrology Group um, and um, Cassie, who did an excellent job um, spearheading this. They uploaded the SnowX 2017 data to a citizen science platform called Zooniverse. And they had volunteers, in this case, classify images in a project that they called Snow Spotter. So if you're interested in, in Snow Spotter, Citizen Science, or even using these images on Zooniverse, um, we've included the links that you can go and check out these platforms. They're, they're really awesome ways to get people involved. They had um, these citizen science scientists respond to questions about the snow and the time-lapse images. So looking at these images and having them observe, is there snow on the ground? Is there snow in the tree branches? Are there clouds in the sky? And they collected all this data and they used it to create a binary time series about the snow conditions um, from 2017. So um, just a really awesome, awesome way to get other people involved thinking about snow science, um, using these new innovative methods for um, collecting snow data. And then um, of course, um, having some interesting time series too. So the 2020 SnowX images will also be uploaded to the Snow Spotter project and classified by citizen scientists as well. At the bottom of our tutorial, if you're, um, if you're, as you're following along, you can take a look at the potential project ideas. At day four, um, we are excited to see that there are people that have already um, taken the lead on some of these projects and, and looking at um, using some of these time-lapse images for their own applications. I know the, the machine learning group where, uh, will have um, some really awesome presentations tomorrow about what they're finding and what data can be collected from it. Um, the, uh, we've included some other ideas here too about how you can compare time-lapse images to other data sets, um, compare the depths across um, within the time-lapse data set, and then um, thinking about extracting um, canopy conditions or cloud cover, even vegetation. So those are all different things that you could pull from these time-lapse imi uh, time images. So if you have um, more questions about data and um, accessing this data, Cassie and I are um, excited to help you and ready to help you um, using the SQL database or the Amazon web server. We've also included the, the GitHub links for the automated methods if you're interested in snow depth extraction. And if you have any other questions, feel free to put them in the Slack channel. Um, shout out to all the people that have helped make this tutorial um, happen. And thank you to the eScience Institute, University of Washington, and then all those that are listed here. And um, if you have any other questions, we'll take a few minutes to answer those too. So thanks all for listening.